Welcome to chapter seven, which is going to be on <clears throat> microbial nutrition, ecology, and growth. So we get to talk about microbes and how we can make them grow and where they naturally live and what they need to survive. So, um, next slide, my computer apparently is deciding to be frozen. All right, so the chemical analysis of cell contents. Like our body, cells, well, our body is made up of cells, but cells are 70% water. Um, they have proteins, and 96% of the cell is composed of six elements. This would be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen. So looking at this diagram, which is figure 7.1 in your book, this is detailing the different environmental conditions that can influence the microbial adaptions. And so the Earth's habitats provide a constant supply of energy, nutrients, and gases, and they also help to maintain a certain pH and temperature, as well as establish communities of interactive organisms. And so you can see kind of like the life cycle over here. And the pH scale is over here, so this is the more acidic ones. These are the more basic or alkaline ones. But you have different soil communities. You have the breakdown of plant matter into detritus and the organic compounds that constitute that. Um, the atmospheric environment, and this is a reservoir for gases such as uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. We also have our sunlight, which we know we need to have to live. And this is the main source of energy for most organisms on Earth. Even though we personally don't photosynthesize, we get our food from plants and uh, animals that eat plants. I have an acorn squash over there for lunch. Okay, and then we also have aquatic microbes. So you can see that we have this whole ecosystem and everything's a well-oiled machine so that we can keep it working very well. So nutrition is a process which carries chemical substances or nutrients that are acquired or obtained from the environment and they are used in cellular activities. So those essential nutrients must be provided to an organism. And there are two different categories of essential nutrients. The first one would be macro nutrients and the other one is micro. Look for your root words, guys, okay? So the macro is gonna be the big where the micro is gonna be the small. So our macronutrients are required in large quantities and they play principal roles in the cell structure and metabolism. And these would be our proteins and our carbohydrates where our micronutrients or trace elements, these are required in small amounts and they are involved in enzymatics function and maintenance of protein structures. Some of these would be manganese, zinc, and nickel. We have our, our, our organic nutrients and organic just means it contains carbon. So if you think of organic chemistry, that's more of a carbon-based, where inorganic is not necessarily carbon-based. There still might be carbons in it, but still when we're talking specifically about carbon, that is gonna be an organic nutrient. So these contain carbon and hydrogen atoms, and these are used, uh, I'm sorry, they're usually the products of living things. So an example of this would be methane or cow farts, right? carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Where our inorganic nutrients, this would be um, an atom or a molecule that contains a combination of atoms other than carbon and hydrogen. And these would be examples of metals and their salts like magnesium sulfate, ferric nitrate, uh, sodium phosphate, and our gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. So where do we get these? Well, for our carbon sources, we can use heterotrophs and these heterotrophs may, must contain carbon in an organic form that is made by other living organisms such as protein carbohydrates lipids and nucleic acids so those are the heterotrophs where they have to obtain them where the autotroph this is an organism that can use carbon dioxide which is an inorganic gas as its carbon source so this is not nutritionally dependent on other living things Growth factors also have to be provided as a nutrient to these microbes and um, bacteria. So our essential, some of these um, nutrient growth factors could be essential amino acids, vitamins, organic compounds that cannot be made or synthesized by an organism because they lack the genetic and metabolic mechanisms to synthesize them. So we have to supplement them, okay? Um, energy sources can be two different. They can either be chemotrophs where they gain energy from chemical compounds like methanogens, um, a kind of chemoautotroph, which produces methane gas under anaerobic conditions, or we can have phototrophs. And these are the ones that are gonna be able to gain energy through photosynthesis. And this would be oxygenic or anoxygenic, so with or without oxygen. 
So talking a little bit more about these heterotroph and their specific energy sources, the majority are chemo heterotrophs and they undergo aerobic respiration. And there are two categories of these. There are saprobes and there are parasites. So saprobes are free living microorganisms that feed on organic detritus, decomposing matter, right, from dead organism, uh, organisms. And the, these are opportunistic pathogens, meaning they will find an opportunity and use it, okay, so they can, um, you know, live this, this, uh, like depending on, dependent on what nutrients they have at that time, they'll make it work. Okay, um, they are a facil facilitative parasite as well. We also have parasites, and these are going to drive nutrients from a host. Okay, we talked about this with like viruses, right? Uh, where it, they need sometimes need a host, but a parasite is not a virus, just to clarify that, right? So, but the parasites are going to derive nutrients from the host, and these would be considered pathogens, and some of these are obligate pathogens. So how do we get around? What is our transport mechanism? Well, passive transport, this is passive. It just kind of happens. Where active transport, we have to actively do something. So passive transport, it doesn't require energy because it's just going to happen. And this is talking about like diffusing down a concentration gradient or um, just going from a concentration of high to low. Okay. So again, it does not require energy. These are substances that exist in a gradient and move from areas of higher concentration towards the areas of lower. So like think of uh, like a water mill. It's going from high to low. Okay. Uh, um, examples of this would be diffusion, osmosis, through the diffusion of water and facilitated diffusion. Now facilitated, you need a facilitator or a helper. And so this is going to require that carrier, but it's still passive, okay? Where active transport, this requires energy and carrier proteins, and it is gradient independent. So I don't care if it's higher on one side or the other, we're using energy to make it happen so we can go up against the gradient. So this would be an example of active transport. So group translocation, where the transported molecule chemically is altered, or bulk transport, which would be endocytosis, exocytosis, and pinocytosis. Okay, so endocytosis bringing it in, exocytosis expelling it, and pinocytosis, I kind of think of that as like a cell drinking water, right? It is kind of encapsulating and pulling in. Okay, um, so what is diffusion? Well, this is the net movement of molecules down their concentration gradient, and this would be an example of passive transport because we do not actively have to expend energy to make it happen. So this would be an example of a diffusion of molecules in an aqueous or liquid solutions. So a high concentration of sugar exists in the cube at the bottom of the liquid, and in an imaginary molecular view of this area shows that the sugar molecules are in a constant state of motion, and so that would be in the lower right-hand corner. Those at the edge of the cube diffuse in the concentrated area into a more dilute region. And as this diffusion continues, then the sugar is going to spread evenly throughout the aqueous phase. And eventually there's not going to be a gradient because it's going to be equally um, diffused or equally um, distributed. And so at that point, then the system is said to be in equilibrium. So this is figure 7.4 in your book. Okay. So then what is osmosis? Well, osmosis is the diffusion of water. And so this would be through passive transport. And this is figure 7.5. And so this is a model system that demonstrates the different, um, um, okay. here we have a solution that's enclosed in a membrane sac, a membrane sac. Okay, so this is usually like a dialysis um, membrane, uh, the tube is what they call them. And it is attached to a hollow, hollow tube. And the membrane is permeable to water, which would be your solvent, but it is not permeable to the solute. The sac is immersed in the container of pure water and it's observed over time. So in A here, you can see that um, the in, I'm sorry, I have an alert coming up. So in A, the, uh, the inset shows a close-up of the osmotic process and the gradient goes from the outer container which is the higher concentration of water into the sac, which is the lower concentration of water. And some water will diffuse in the opposite direction, but the net gradient, which means the overall gradient, favors osmosis to the sac. So then in B here, what we can see is that as the water um, diffuses into the sac, the volume increases and forces the excess solution into the tube, which will then raise continuously. And then in C, even if or even as the solution becomes diluted, there will still be osmosis into the sac. 
An equilibrium will not occur because the solutions can never become equal. And why is that? Think of uh, surface area in space, okay? There's no way that we can um, equilate equilibrate in this small amount of space with having such a high concentration in that sex. Sex, okay? So this would be an example of osmosis, which is water diffusion. So then um, this is figure 7.6, and this would be responses to solution of dis different osmotic concentrations. And so if we have an isoosmotic, um, I'm sorry, an isotonic solution, this means that things are going in and out A-OK, -okay, and we're going to have a normal uh, cell. But if we have a hypotonic solution, that means that fluid is going to come in to the, where it's a lower concentration, so it's going to try to dilute it out, and that can cause the cell to explode. Well, on the other hand, if you have a hypertonic solution, then we can draw too much water out of the cell, and it can actually cause the um, cell to uh, shrivel up and die. Okay, so these would be examples of your osmotic content differentiations, and this is again in Figure 7.6. So, what is the difference between facilitated diffusion and uh, which is, or I'm sorry, what is facilitated diffusion? Well, this is a, an example of passive transport, okay? So this is a way and a helper to get a molecule across the, um, the membrane. So you can see here with the purple dots that we're trying to get them from outside the cell into the cell. And so we're going to have to use a transport molecule or mechanism to help move that because this can't do it by itself. So it has to be facilitated, kind of like back in the day when we had a facilitator to like help monitor and make sure we weren't cheating on our tests or something like that, right? So a facilitation is just a helping of that um, reaction, okay? So as you can see, the facilitator is going to just be helping the cells go from the inside to the outside. Okay, and this is um, found in uh, figure 7.7. .7. And so this is a facilitated diffusion that involves the attachment of a molecule to a specific protein carrier. And bonding of that molecule causes a conformational change in the protein that facilitates or um, helps the molecule's passage across from the membrane. The membrane proton releases the molecule into the cell interior, and the cell does not have to expend energy, okay? But it has a helper, but it is still not using energy. All right, so then, fine. So what is then carrier-mediated um, active transport, okay? And this is in figure 7.8. So this one has um, where you have a membrane-bound transporter that is going to be um, a, a protein, and this is going to interact with the nearby solute, okay? Um, so and it's going to be binding proteins that carry essential solutes such as like sodium, iron, and sugars. And once the binding of the protein attaches to the specific site, an ATP or NMG molecule is going to be activated and generate energy to pump the solute into the cell's interior through a special channel in the uh, permease. Okay, so basically we're still going to use a carrier, but at this point we need energy, okay, to help. But you have that carrier that's going to get it from the extracellular into the intracellular, and um, it doesn't really matter about the gradient because we're going to be um, you know, actively transporting that. And then this one would be in group translocation, and this is where the specificity of the molecule is actively captured, but on its passage through the membrane protein character. <laughs> carrier and it is chemically altered so you can see here that these little boxes are getting stuck on so they're chemically altered or changed or activated to be used in the cell so by putting these two processes together and coupling the transport with the synthesis then the cell can conserve energy because usually our cells try to conserve energy the best way that they can so that we don't have to use too much we're very very efficient so what about this then? And again, this is still in figure 7.8. So what is endocytosis? Well, this is going to be a way of bringing substances into the cell through either a vesicle or a phagosome. So I kind of call these like little Pac-Man sacs. Okay, so basically you're going to have a Pac-Man grab the nutrient or whatever you want to bring it in, pinch it off into a vesicle and bring it in. So that would be phagocytosis. Where pinocytosis, this is more for liquids. And so like I said before, I kind of think of it as a pine tree drinking, which does not make sense, I know, but the pinocytosis is going to be liquid where phagocytosis is going to be substances or cells. 
So what are some different environmental factors that influence these microbes? Well, a niche is a specialized thing, right? So this is an, an organism's specific role in the environment, and it includes all of its, its ad oh my gosh, and all of its adaptations to that environment. And the environmental factors that can uh, affect the function of the metabolic processes or enzymatic reactions include temperature, oxygen requirements, pH, changes in pH, osmotic pressures, as well as bariatric pressure. So when we're specifically talking about temperatures, we have a minimum temperature, we have a maximum temperature, and we have an optimum temperature. So let's look at our body. 98.6, 37 degrees Celsius is my happy zone. I'll still function if I'm a degree or two up or down, and that'll be okay. But that's not good. But then we get to our maximum and then that, or our minimum, and that's when our systems start to shut down. So our minimum temperature is the lower te lowest temperature that permits microbes growth and metabolism. So for instance, hypothermia, I'd still potentially be alive, but I'm not functioning very well. Maximum temperature would be the highest temperature that permits the microbes growth and metabolism. So it's higher than normal, but we're still okay. Where our optimum temperature, that's gonna be our happy zone. And this is where we're gonna be promoting the fastest rate of growth and metabolism. So again, for our body, it would be 37 Celsius, 98.6 Fahrenheit. So grouping the different types of microorganisms into these groups, we have the psychrophiles, and these have an optimum temperature of below 15 degrees Celsius, so they get really cold. And these are capable of growth at zero degrees as well. And so these are also known as cryophiles. File, philic means love, cryo, cryopreservation means very, very cold, right? And so think of these would be um, microbes and stuff that could grow in the Arctic. So they can tolerate very cold temperatures. Mesophiles, files these are optimum temperatures of room temperature and these are most of the human pathogens because they are surviving in the environment that our body is happiest in right and then we have thermophiles and this is where we have the optimum temperature that would be greater than 45 degrees celsius okay and so this is in figure 7.9 if you want to look on that um talking about gas requirements when we're looking at oxygen as oxygen is utilized, it's transformed into several different toxic products. We have a singlet oxygen, we have a superoxide ion, and we have peroxide as well as hydroxyl radicals. So a singlet oxygen is denoted because it has the one up here in the upper left-hand corner. A superoxide ion, iron has, ion has an extra charge, so it's O2 minus. Peroxide is like hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. There's a joke like, oh, I want H2O when somebody goes to the barn and bar. And then somebody says, oh, I want H2O2. And then that second person dies, ha ha ha, because H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Obviously, it's toxic if you drink it. Kind of a silly science joke. And then those hydroxyl radicals, because OH would be your hydroxyl group. Okay. So most cells have developed enzymes that neutralize these chemicals. And so this would be like a superoxide dismutase or a catalase. Okay. But if a microbe is not capable of dealing with toxic oxygen, it's forced to live in an oxygen-free habitat. So there are different categories of oxygen requirements. Okay, We have aerobes, which means that it can utilize oxygen and detoxify it. Okay? We have an obligate aerobe, which means it's obligated to grow with oxygen, so it cannot grow without oxygen. So obligate means I need to, obligated to. Aerobe is part of aerobic metabolism, or aerobic, right? The word with oxygen. Uh, faculative or uh, anaerobe, this means that it utilizes, out of, ugh, utilizes oxygen, but it can also grow in its absence. We also have our microaerophilic, and this requires only a small amount of oxygen. We have our anaerobe, and this does not utilize oxygen. We have our obligate anaerobe, and this lacks enzymes to detoxify oxygen, so it cannot survive in an oxygen environment. And then we have aerotolerant anaerobes, and these do not utilize oxygen, but they can survive and grow in its presence. So when we're looking at how we can differently culture these things, which is what we are working on in our microbiology lab, then we can see that um, you know, we can culture them in different ways depending on the oxygen requirement. Okay, So if we have an anaerobic um, microbe that we're trying to grow, then we're going to use a very um, capped test tube, right, so that no oxygen can get in. 
where if it is an aerobic, well then obviously we need to have um, oxygen. So we need to have it in a cracked tube, or a, not a cracked one, but uh, where the top is not tightly wound. Okay, so we can depend, depending on the different oxygen requirements, it helps us to, you know, break apart what we need and how we can specifically culture that one microbe. So on the left is figure 711, and this is the use of thioglycolate broth to demonstrate oxygen requirements. So the thioglycolate is a reducing medium that can establish a gradation in oxygen content, where the oxygen, oxygen concentration is the highest in the top of the tube, and it is absent in the deeper regions. When a series of tubes is inoculated with bacteria that differ in oxygen requirements, the relative position and where it grows in the tube provides some indication of their adaptations to oxygen use. So on this far left tube here, we can see that this is aerobic, okay? And so this is an example of Pseudomonas aerogeniosia, okay? In tube two, we have this facilitative, and this is Staph aureus, okay? And then in three, we have also a facilitative, and this would be E. coli. So you can see that it's it's more throughout. Where in four, we have an obligate anaerobe. Okay, so this would be uh, like clostridium. Okay, so it only grows where there is no oxygen. And then we can use this because an anaerobic environment chamber can be made and used to and equipped with ports for handing strict analog anaerobes without exposing them to air. So you're like space suit going in there, but it's going to be no oxygen, right? And it also has provisions for incubation and inspection of a completely oxygen-free um, environment. So there's different ways to be able to study these. So then what about if we're looking at carbon dioxide requirements? Well, if some microbes need oxygen, some of them might need more carbon dioxide, right? So this would be an example of that. So all microbes require some carbon dioxide in their metabolism. And so if we have a capnophile, then this grows best CO2 tends than what is normally present in the atmosphere. So we have to kind of um, aid their CO2 environment, the concentration in their environment. Okay. So moving on to pH. The majority of microorganisms grow to pH between 6 and 8, and these would be neutrophiles, neutral for pH neutral, which is 7. Okay, acidophiles are going to grow at the acidic or lower numbers, where alkalinophiles are going to grow at extremely alkaline or basic pHs. Then, what about osmotic pressure? So, most microbes exist under hypotonic or isotonic conditions. And we have halophiles, and these require a high concentration of salt. We have osmotolerant, and these do not require high concentrations of a solute, but they can tolerate it when it does occur. What about other environmental factors? Well, we have barophiles. Think of barobarometric pressure, and these can survive under extreme pressures, and they will rupture if they're exposed to normal atmospheric pressures. So things basically are, you know, they're, they're, they like what they like, and if you get them outside of their happy zone, things are going to happen, okay? So here are some ecological associations, okay? So we have symbiotic, which means that organisms live in close nutritional relationships that are required by one or both of the members. You can have mutual, uh, communal, or parasitic, where we have non-symbiotic, and these are organisms that are not, or that are free living relationships that are not required for um, survival. So we can have a synergistic or an antagonistic um, interaction. So what are any of the relationships then? We are human, last time I checked. So the human body is a rich habitat for symbiotic bacteria, fungi, and new protozoa. And this would be your normal microbe on your um, skin, in your body, etc. Then you have commensal, parasitic, and synergistic relationships between the different microbes that are growing. Okay. Okay. So um, we have biofilms. We talked about biofilms before, but now we get to talk about them a little bit more specifically. And so biofilms result when organisms attach to a substrate by some form of extracellular matrix that binds them together in complex organized layers. And these are going to dominate the structure of most um, natural environments on Earth. 
and they communicate and, and cooperate with the formation and function of biofilms, um, and this is called quorum sensing when they work together. Okay. The computer's being really slow right now. So what is biofilm and quorum sensing? Well, this is in uh, figure 7.14 of your book. So in step one here, you can see that free swimming, swimming cells are gonna settle on a surface and remain there. And then in step two, the cells are going to make or synthesize a sticky matrix that holds them tightly to the substrate. <clears throat> in step three, we have when the biofilm grows to a certain density, which would be that quorum, then the cells release the inducer molecules that can coordinate a response. And then in four, the enlargement of one cell to show the genetic induction occurs. And this inducer molecule is going to like the expression of a particular gene, and it's going to make or synthesize a protein product, such as an enzyme. And then in step five, the cells are going to secrete their enzymes in unison to digest those food particles. So how do we study microbial growth? Well, microbial growth occurs at two levels. One is at the growth of the cellular level, which increases in size, and then the other one is an increase in population. So the division of bacterial cells mainly occurs through binary fission. Um, this is transverse fission. And so this is when the parent cell is going to enlarge and it duplicates, which once it duplicates, it's going to duplicate that chromosomal material, the genetic material in the chromosome, and then it forms a central transverse septum that is going to divide the cell into two daughter cells. So this is what binary fission is. It's binary by meaning two fission is to fuse or unfuse in this situation. So this is figure 7.15 in your book. So this is where we have a young cell at an early phase of the cycle. And then the parent cell prepares for the division by the enlarging the cell wall, okay, the cell membrane, as well as the overall volume. And then midway in the cell right here, the wall develops snatches that will eventually form into the transverse septum or divider. And then this duplicated chromosome becomes affixed or attached to a special um, membrane site. And then in step three, the septum grows, or that splitter, right, is going to grow inward, and the chromosomes are pulled towards the opposite cell ends as the membrane enlarges. Then other cytoplasmic components are distributed up randomly into the two developing cells. Okay, and then that septum is going to be made completely throughout the uh, center of the cell. The cell membrane uh, is going to patch itself so that there are now two separate different um, cell chambers. And then at this point, the daughter cells are going to be divided, and some species are going to separate completely, as shown here, while others are going to remain attached, forming chains of doublets. Okay. Um, so what about the rate of population growth? Okay, this is figure 7.16 in your book. The time that is required for a complete fission cycle is called the generation or the doubling time. And for each new vision cycle, uh, fission cycle, this increases the population by a factor of two. And so this is known as exponential growth. And the generation times vary from minutes to days, dependent on what organism it is. Some of them are cell are slow starters and salt. Oh God, I'm sorry, my brain is like fried. Slow starters and slow growers. Others are just very, 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 very fast. Okay, so on figure 7.16, you can see over here that starting with a single cell, which would be at the apex over here, if a product of reproduction goes on to divide by binary fission, the population is going to double with each new cell division or generation. And this process can be represented by logarithmic scales. So this would be raised to raised to the exponent or by simple numbers. Okay, so you can see the number of generations, the exponential value, or just the number of cells. Okay, where in B, you can plot this logarithmic scale of the cells by and it's going to produce a straight line which is indicative of the exponential growth whereas plotting the cell numbers arithmic arithmically so by each of them okay is going to give a curved slope okay so the left one would be called logarithmic and the right one is arithmetic okay so you get to the same answer this is just this one is more uh, accurate for actual cell growth so what is the rate of population growth then well, the, this is an equation for calculating the population size over time. Nf equals Ni times 2 to the nth power. 
So NF would be the total number of cells in the population, so that final number. And I is the number initially, so that'd be the starting number of cells. The N is the exponent, and so this would be how many generations we're talking about, right? And then the 2N is the number of cells in that generation. Okay, so that's the formula that you're going to need to remember. So if we look at this in a fun picture, this is in figure 7.17 of your book. Okay, and so you can see that if you place this few cells into the sterile liquid medium, then you incubate this culture over a period of several hours, which is denoted here, okay, and then you sample the broth, okay, at regular intervals during the incubation, and then you are going to plate each sample onto a solid media, okay, so you can take a sample out, and then plate it, and then you're going to count the number of colonies that are present after each inoculation. So you can see in the first generation, there's none, right? There's like one, right? And then it doubles, and then it doubles again, and then it doubles, and it doubles, and doubles, and doubles. And so that would be your exponents. Okay. So it's pretty cool. It grows very, very quickly because they double each time. So then we can look at what is the population growth curve. So in laboratory studies, populations typically display a predictable pattern over time, and this is called a growth curve. And so the stages in the normal growth curve is going to be step one, which is the lag phase. And this is the flat period of adjustment right here, um, the enlargement, and there's just little growth because they're kind of amping up to grow. And this is figure 7.18 for your book if you want to follow along. Step two is going to be the exponential growth phase, and this is a period of maximum growth that will continue as long as the cells have adequate nutrient in a favorable environment. When you get to step three, this is going to be your stationary phase, and it's kind of plateaued up here. And this is where this rate of cell growth equals the rate of cell death caused by depleted nutrients. And oxygen and the excreted uh, excretion of organic acids and pollutants is going to kind of uh, equalize that out. So we don't have the best nutrients anymore. So our growth rate equals the death rate. So we have a plateau there. Okay. Then four is going to be your death phase here. And this is where as limiting factors intensify, the cells are going to die off exponentially. Okay. And so then eventually everything's going to be dead because you ran out of nutrients. Okay. So how do we you or how do we analyze this population growth? Okay. Well, this is figure 7.19 in your book. And the most simple would be turbidity. And we've done this in lab. When we tried to do the liquid broth, and when I've shown you liquid broth, one of the first things I did was look through it. Okay, if it's clear, that means that there's no growth, where if it's turbid or cloudy, then this means that there is a form of growth, okay? So turbidity is just a fancy word for the degree of cloudiness or turbidity, which reflects the relative size of the portion. So you can do this um, scientifically too using, um, you know, a spectrophotometer, right, so that we can actually look at how it's growing. So then we can see if the light shines through a whole bunch, then we don't have a lot of um, growth because the light's transmitted. Where if there is a lot of growth, it's going to be bounced off and it's not going to be as clear of a transmission. So we're going to have more growth. Um, you can also, this is figure 7.20, and this would be a direct microscopic count of the bacteria. And so you literally count viable cells. And I've done this before and it can get tedious, but it's kind of fun and it gives you a very good number. Okay, so you directly count the cells or you count all the cells present, um, automated or manual, you know how much sample you put in, you calculate how many or you count how many cells are there, and then you can denote how much the concentration is into the actual concentration of your media. Because if you use one microliter and you found 100 cells, then if you had, you know, 100 microliter, you'd have, you know, 10,000 cells. So you can do that. So there's a lot of awesome, very fun ways to um, be able to determine if your cells are growing. So that is all for this chapter. Have a good one, guys.